everyone, our webinar workshop on social emotional learning skills, grit, and resilience. So I am happy that you are here with me. I am Francis Jim Toscano, and let's start. So let me just um, share my screen as we begin. All right, so again, for those who have been uh, watching me, um, I am Francis Jim Toscano. I'm an EdTech coordinator and department chairperson, and I'm also an Apple professional learning specialist and Apple distinguished educator. Um, I work with other schools uh, to, to guide them on their technology integration, and at this time, to adapt um, the online or different modalities of distance education. Um, if you want to know more about uh, what I do, um, you can subscribe um, to, to learn more ideas for distance learning or education in general, especially with technology, uh, through my EmpowerEd platform. So that's EmpowerEd with Francis Jim Toscano. It's a, actually an education advocacy, and now we have different podcast shows, uh, different um, video series, which you can find on YouTube on Facebook, on Spotify, and even in Apple Podcasts. So if you want to learn more about uh, ideas for distance learning or education with technology integration, then search for my EmpowerEd um, advocacy account. I'm pretty sure you will learn a lot from the videos that I've been working on and sharing. So thank you so much for those who have subscribed. Thank you so much. And to our listeners, our podcast show is actually uh, has actually been in the charts in the top podcast charts in the Philippines, both Spotify and Apple Podcasts, in Qatar, in Singapore, Indonesia, in Australia, and even in Canada. So thank you so much for your for listening and for appreciating our work. All right, so let's start. Um, my presentation will have two. Um, two parts. One will talk about Maslow before and Bloom, and at the same time, how do we enable relationship? How we design for relationships, grit, grit, or even resiliency or resilience um, in in our as we explore different distance uh, education modalities for now. Okay, so one of the main um, resources that I've I've used here is the report. Um, thinking about pedagogy in an unfolding pandemic, which I have co-written with three other amazing educators from the different parts of the world. And this report was submitted um, to UNESCO and Education International to inform their work on, on what's happening about the pandemic. This was sent on uh, March 29. So after almost like more than two months, we now uh, we now can see how this is being used. So if you want to download this, go online because this has been um, used by a lot of schools from, uh, from K to 12 and higher education to make sense of how we can do distance learning at this time of the pandemic. So we will start with our uh, discussion with asking how are our students? So how are the students or how are the students uh, when, when the pandemic hit us? So, you know, there's a, there's a survey in the United States for, this is for college students, and they asked how the COVID-19 has, you know, uh, taken effect on, on their life. So this was in April 2020. They surveyed uh, 2,000 plus college students. And, you know, a lot of those responses were really about the negative uh, effect of, of the COVID-19 pandemic and their mental health. And you know what, what has been the effect? Number one, it's stress or anxiety. You can see in the graph, it's really, really um, you know, obvious. Um, disappointment or sadness, loneliness or isolation, especially when, they, when we are in home quarantine right now or maybe in home isolations. Financial setbacks, because a lot of, the, a lot of those students are also working students. So there are a lot of, of, of challenges you know, if that they cannot earn their, their money. And then of course, relocation. Um, they have to move out immediately out of, out of the universities or colleges and, and go back to their homes so that they can continue distance learning and of course be safe. And another, uh, another chart would show us, you know, um, student self-care challenges. When they have to take care of their themselves, what has been the challenges in their life? 
uh, in their uh, in their life right now. So number one, they said it's hard to maintain a routine, and we know as educators that routine gives us a sense of of normalcy, gives us a sense of of the things that are needed to be done. Uh, more than that, I think it's it's what will set up the regular day, right? And then of course, um, the students are now students are now in their uh, in their homes, and sometimes uh, and and of course there are a lot of restrictions. So they cannot get enough physical activity. And we know how important physical activity is. I have been in my apartment for more than three months now. And right now, it's really hard to go out because of some, you know, um, some cases around us uh, or around me. And I don't want to go out. But then I, my, physical, uh, my physical health is also being affected. I have to find a way to exercise, at least to exercise or, you know, bring those sweat out of my body you know that 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 is really challenging and then of course staying connected with uh with others i think this is one thing that we need to recognize uh, at this time of the pandemic staying connected with other people is actually one of the most challenging part um and it doesn't it doesn't only mean you know taking time to always say that that has been really a problem so there so in in uh in my research, these are the common things that come out um that have been really you know preoccupying or affecting negatively our students. Number one, boredom and uneasiness. Uh boredom because they can't do anything. You're just in the house, you're in the same with, with the same people, Their, your routine has already bored you. You know, uneasiness because you know, um you cannot you cannot do whatever things that you want to do. Um, for those who are, to those who are, you know, physically engaged, those who are physically active, if you put them in a certain uh, location and it's very restricted, and you know there are only a few people whom they are encountering and uh, encountering, so you know it, it it gives them a sense of boredom and uneasiness. Another one is frustration and fear. They get frustrated. Um, some of those who were doing distance education, some of their students are, felt frustrated that they don't, uh, they, that they don't get it immediately, that it's really hard to connect to the internet, you know, things like that. And they fear, they fear for the safety, they fear for their grades, they fear for the safety of the people that they live with. So you have all of these things. So it will now result to over feeling overwhelmed feeling anxious uh, you know you have the pandemic anxiety at some point before students felt overwhelmed with a lot of uh, lessons that they have to do for distance education and that could happen again as we prepare for the next school year and then you, of course you have depression um, trauma trauma is one important thing that we need to consider especially when our students or when some of our students are actually or have actually you know um, I have actually felt the effect, directly felt the effect of, of the COVID-19. Parents getting, you know, losing their job. They might have parents or relatives who died and they never saw after, you know, um, things like that. Those could work, uh, those could actually um, create trauma in our students and they are at home and there are no people or maybe there are only a few people who could take care of them and process all those things. Right, so these are the things that we need to look. And of course, right now there's um, the, the rate of domestic violence and abuse is actually going up. You know, um, especially when they are in uh, when 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 kids live in a family that is you know there's not much space. So it could it could it could bring out domestic violence and abuse. And then of course missing the sense of belonging. You know, and and friendship that goes kinds of things. So. A lot of this are psychological in aspect, psychosocial in aspect. And you know, uh, when I'm, as I speak about this, I'm not claiming to be an expert in psychosocial um, development or human development. But you know, as an educator, I also feel that I, I believe and I feel like, you know, in the end, we also have the responsibility to understand what's happening with our students. And this could help us in, uh, or inform what we're going to do at this time when we need to help our students. And you know, one, one, major, one major study that came out says that the most vulnerable students are less likely to receive the support and extra services they need. They risk f 
falling further behind and becoming isolated with school doors closed. Who are the most vulnerable students? Our students who belong to the low, uh, low or lowest uh, economic, uh, social economic status, uh, those who depend on you know, free meals being given home. I know that there are schools especially public schools who have free meals for their kids or for their students. So if the school is closed, then there are no free meals, right? So how, how would then they eat? Because I, I, that's an important support for them. Um, the, the people at uh, the, uh, the far places of the Philippines, you know, the indigenous people, um, students who belong to minorities, you know, those, uh, I mean, these are the kids that they don't, that don't usually get support. And now we're saying that with, with schools uh, closed, then it's harder for educators, for teachers, and even for services to, to reach out to them. So we need to be careful with this. Those students with um, challenges in terms of academic, or maybe in, 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 in uh, those, who will, uh, those students with special needs, at, in, if they're at home, it, it's possible that the, even their parents don't know how to handle them. Right, so these kinds of of students, the vulnerable students, are the one, are the one who will be needing much help, and we will not be able to do that because they are far from from us, you know. And then, of course, uh, that's the context why we're pushing for Maslow before Bloom. Um, Maslow before Bloom was the battle cry of of the of the report that we have written, and it really centered on how we could help our students uh, adjust adjust to what's happening right now. So Maslow before Bloom speaks about, you know, it, it, it basically tells us that we need to understand, we need to make sure that our, our students have met, you know, the, the, the basic needs under Ma that Maslow states before they can even learn. You know, I, I'm going to give you a context in, in, in physical face-to-face -face classroom, I always hear this. You know, it's hard to teach students who are hungry. It's hard to teach students who are not given their basic physiological needs, right? And that's, that's the same thing right now. It doesn't change. It's hard to teach students whose needs, whose basic needs, physiological needs, safety needs, love and belonging, you know, those everything are... Uh, everything in under Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if those are not met, then it's hard for students to learn and to understand. You know, it's hard for them to focus. So at this time of the pandemic, when we were adapting to it, when we were adjusting to it, we 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 reminded the teachers and say, and even school leaders and say, you know, you're focusing again too much on the academics. You're trying to to and that's very understandable. You're trying to to bridge the gap in, in instruction and in assessment, but you're forgetting something. You need to make sure that the students are okay. The students are okay because if they're not okay, then the best lesson plan, the best assessment that you've planned will not work for them. Before, there was no enough time. There was not enough time to work on this. So there was a rapid transition. And all of us were caught off guard, right? Even the pub, different sectors actually were caught off guard. And even the public education or the private education, public and private education system were actually caught off guard. So right now, let's make sure that students are okay before we even teach. And one aspect that we want to focus on is on social emotional learning. What is a social emotional learning? It's how children and adults learn to understand and manage emotions, set goals, show empathy for others, establish positive relationships, and make responsible decisions. You know, when, when we look at these things, these are the things, these are the skills that our students need to cope up with the pandemic. And yet what we're saying is that, you know, let's do Maslow before Bloom. Let's make sure that these skills are actually intact. And this, if these skills are not intact, then we have to make sure that we are, we are actually going to teach our students or help our students develop these skills. Because these skills will, will allow them to survive and thrive at this time of the pandemic. Let's talk about how we can further develop these skills later on. Now, as we prepare for the new school year, 
Uh, in the new school year, we're doing emergency remote distance uh, learning and teaching. Let's break that down. Emergency. We are in a state of public health emergency. We're not doing remote or distance learning just because we want to. You know, uh, there are a lot of universities like the University of the Philippines Open University where the normal is distance education. They never do face-to-face -face, and there are a lot of e schools and universities like that. So don't see this as, you know, maybe it's an experiment. No, no, no. It's not an experiment because people have done this. It's just that a lot of us will be adopting it for the first time. So therefore, we need to understand that even the requirements, even the needs, even the things that we're doing will not be the same with what we have been doing in, 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 the, norm, in the, the old normal that we have. So let's, re, let's remember, we are preparing for the new school year. We say the new normal or whatever, but the new normal there is that we're going to do emergency remote distance learning and teaching. There will be different modalities, and when you want, if you want to know about the different modalities, I have a, a, a uh, I have an edu lecture uh, in, on my Empower Edu uh, webpage on what is distance education and understanding the different modalities. So let's let's let you you can visit my Facebook and YouTube channel to understand more. Okay, but. Um, for United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. So um, we look at their handbook, and, and the handbook actually gives three important steps on how to adapt on, on emergency situation. For this one, we're talking about refugees, but it's still the same. Uh, we can actually adapt this to better understand what's happening in our context right now. The first one is to you know create an emergency protocol to provide immediate physical and psychosocial protection. This is what we want our students to have at this time of the pandemic. We need to ensure that their physical and psychosocial um, health is actually or actually protected, right? So that's the first thing that we want to do. That's why we said no classes, no face of face because it's dangerous. You need to stay at home where you are safe. Second, you need to have a safe and quality education during and after an emergency. That's why people are asking for what is your plan. That's why DepEd and CHED came up with their protocols, with their policies, with their education continuity to make sure that there's a safe and quality, high quality education while at the pandemic and even after the pandemic. So that it's important to align with what CHED and DepEd has been pushing in terms of continuity program. And then number three, education provides a sense of continuity. The way we will do education will now need to be seen as it's continuous. It will now provide for the new sense of normalcy. It should now be continuous, meaning because we have adopted this modality, then it's very possible that this kind of modality should be sustained. It's how we will sustain it that will be really, really important to, this, uh, to talk about. So we're done with number one. We're really working on number two. On number three, we need to get ready for that. We need to understand how we can make sense of, of, of how we can sustain um, the learning and teaching process at this time of the pandemic. So therefore, what we want to do is to move from Maslow before Bloom. Maslow before Bloom is very, very important. You need to consider that. But once we start, once we have prepared and you know made uh, made sure that they are that they are safe that they are ready then we now proceed to maslow and bloom what is how will how should we understand now so in maslow we build and sustain social emotional learning skills the one that i've mentioned about we continue to sustain their physiological needs uh, their sense of safety and belonging at the same time because we have we are sustaining those things already, we need to make sure that under Bloom, we continue to encourage and support students to continue learning. That is the meaning of Maslow plus Bloom or end Bloom. Before, at the first part, it's Maslow before Bloom. Now that we have ensured that Maslow is okay, we need to sustain it so that now we can now bring in Bloom. The Bloom part, I think, is the I think right now we are very much focused on the bloom. But as our, let us ask ourselves, have we thought of the Maslow part? Are, how are we sure that our students are safe? 
the plans that we have right now, are they going to be helpful if our students do not have access to devices, do not access to food, do not access to their, you know, to the basic needs that they have? And whose responsibility, right? When we, talk at, uh, when we look at the bigger education system, whose responsibility is it, right? Whose responsibility to ensure that the students are okay if the parents cannot do that because of financial constraints or other constraints? Who's gonna, who's gonna do it, right? I think that's a very, very important moral questions that we need to understand. So therefore, in reality, Maslow and Bloom are not separate things. They are on different areas. They're talking about different areas. But in the end, but in the end, they're just two sides of one single coin. They're just two sides of one important reality that we want to happen to our students. We want them to be safe. We want them to, to, to be okay. We want their needs sustained. But at the same time, we want them to learn. We want them to do not stop learning. We want to support and, and encourage them. That is Maslow and Bloom. So I hope you are able to understand what we mean by that. Maslow, Maslow and Bloom, Maslow before Bloom to Maslow and Bloom. And you know, this is coming from the context that we need to adapt to or adjust to at this time of the, uh, of the pandemic and the new normal that we are experiencing. The new normal is not, not even new anymore because we're now in the new normal, right? So we need to understand and adjust the way we deal with our students as we prepare for the coming school year, okay? So that ends the first part. Let us now get ready for the second part of my talk. The second part of my talk is about designing for relationship, grit, and resilience or resiliency. And I think it's very, very important to understand what it would mean by these words. Number one, relationship talks about the connections, bonds, the sense of belonging, the sense of positive community that is formed when students learn together. That is what we mean by relationship. It, that relationship can be built upon by the interaction between the teacher and the student, student to students, or the teacher and the student. So there's a sense of community. There's a sense of connection. There's a positive and safe, you know, um, sense of community and, and bond in, uh, in, in the classroom that is created. So we want to continue that. So therefore, we want to design for relationship. How can we now design for relationship in the different modalities of distance education, right? That's the question that we want to understand right now. And then I brought out the word grit. If you have heard from um, Angela Duckworth, uh, I think she was one of the, she's the one who is really, you know, brought forth the idea of grit in, into the mainstream in education. Grit is about having the passion and perseverance for long-term goals. Grit is not just, you know, I love this, uh, so I will do it. Or, or you know, uh, grit, uh, grit it's, not, it's not also be, about being talented. Uh, it's not about being, you know, um, lucky. No, it's not. That's not grit. Grit is persevering about what you are passionate about. And so that no matter uh, no matter what kind of mistake you encounter, it doesn't you know it doesn't really affect you because you want to continue doing it. So that even if you fail, you continue doing it. And then of course we have resilience. Resilience is the optimism to keep bouncing back from failure. Resilience is often talked about in the country, especially if we are experiencing you know unfortunate events. Resilience is not meant to be romanticized. Okay, resilience does not mean um, doing this on our own while letting, letting the, 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 the different systems in the country not doing their job. No, Where, whatever kind of system we have in the country, whoever is leading those systems, then they must make sure that they are actually delivering the needs of the, uh, of the people, the citizens. Resilience is actually, while in that situation, we will continue to bounce back. All right, so we need to understand relationship, grit, and resilience. We put them together in order to help our students cope with the pandemic, cope with the negative effects of the school closure that we will we continue to um, to to experience. This has been one observation that we that I have found uh, in my research. 
Many educators are keenly and understandably focused on getting the academic strike with distance learning. A lot, see, a lot of the webinars workshops that you have heard are about how to design learning experiences, how to use technology tools. There are a lot of how-tos right now, but if you look at it, there are a few people talking about, you know, how do we help parents? How do we help students cope with the pandemic? What is social emotional learning, you know? And we, we know that we, we, lack, uh, that, uh, we lack guidance counselors in, in our schools, in a lot of schools, especially in the public school system. You know, so why is there no one talking about this? Why do we have only a few presentations like mine, right? A lot of people are stuck with the how-tos, technology. Everything is about technology. But we're forgetting something, social emotional learning. So if you are doing in-service training right now or your IMSET, may I suggest that you push, you ask your school leaders to talk about how to support students in their social emotional learning. This is very, very important. I will be giving you some ideas, but it's also important that there is a discussion among the members, among the teachers of your school. So one way to do this is actually to build community, to build connections, and to build relationships. How do we do that? We want to build relationships that uh, we know that building relationship is important in sustaining a positive, respectful, and safe online community, right? Um, the teachers are given the opportunities or give or should uh, should make sure that there is a, a positive relationship being built in the online community. What do you mean by positive? Positive is there's a sense of respect. When you're, when you're, for example, because why am I talking about online communities? Because in, in the different modalities, it might be hard to form communities because students are on their own. But for those going to online distance learning, when you ask your students to go online together, then you need to make sure that you, you have established protocols. How do you be, how, how, how can you show respect to other people when you're talking online? How, how do you make sure that it's a positive uh, environment? There's no cyberbullying, everyone is respectful, everything is safe, right? You need to ensure that. Um, how do you ensure that your online classes has a sense of belonging, that they see other people as their classmates or maybe as, as possible peers or friends? So that is something that you want to talk, uh, you think through. Um, some of the things that you can do is, number one, to take a look at the different interactions that will happen and how do you how do you take advantage of them your intention is to establish community establish connection and relationship so you know teacher to individual learners you can always email them do uh, use back channel apps uh, like schoology for messaging or other platforms you could also schedule a video conference and ask how they are Right, that's one way of checking how they are if they're okay at this time of the pandemic, and you know to build a sense of trust. I think that's very very important. Teachers need to build a sense of trust uh, for from their students or with their students. That's very very important. And then you have of course teacher to among learners. I think this is the the online community, the big online community that we're talking about. When you schedule synchronous video conferences, you know ask them how they are. Connect with them. Uh, you can also have uh, asynchronous discussion forums like Freedom Wall, where they can post uh, post post about what 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 they are feeling right now, uh, their reaction to what's happening, so that you can um, actually process them. And of course, you can take advantage of your relationship with your parents. You can email and video conference them to like an a parent teacher conference that is virtual. That's one good thing that you can do. No, um, these are the things that you could do to foster a sense of community, connection, the sense, uh, a sense of connection with the students, even with the parents. Remember, the parents are our partners at this time of the pandemic also. Other options for other modalities. What if you cannot go online? Call them. Give, send them a text message, especially if, uh, for the parents, if you have the number of the parents, or if they own a, a, a cell phone. You know, if they don't have these devices and you are and, and your community allows you to travel around, like to deliver um, learning packets or modules, you know, you could always, you know, uh, uh, take that opportunity to say hi to them, to ask how they are, of course, still observing. Um, proper uh, social distancing protocols, but you know um, there are other ways. There are a lot of ways you, uh, of of how you could um, 
build a sense of connection and ha ask how they are. You could also write letters. You can ask them to write letters to their classmates and have them delivered. If there are delivery systems in, in your community, you could actually do that. Or through the, the barangay tanods, you know, barangay tanod, or, or those um, taking care, doing um, uh, roundups in, in your community, you could actually ask them to give out the letters for your students or your uh, uh, class, uh, your students' letters to, to, to different people. All right? Video conferencing to check in with students or, video, or just calling them, finding out how they're feeling. If they seem stressed, what might they seem stressed about? You know, it, we need to go beyond talking about, you know, did you get this? Are you okay with what you have learned? Have you practiced this? Let's go beyond that thought. Let's talk about how they are feeling. How, what is causing their stress? How are they coping up? I think this is one important thing that we need to uncover. We need to uncover or we need to cover at this time of the pandemic. This is one example of a teacher who's been speaking to you. Um, Jerome Jaime uh, uh, makes use of Padlet to support learners. He talks about what they, uh, he has a freedom wall and he posts questions and then he let his students you know, comment. And the questions are really beyond just academics. It's even what they worry about, their technical problems, their expectations, and what they need, especially in terms of at this time of the pandemic. So that is one way of doing that. And then, of course, if you're having your class positive reinforcement through Class Dojo, you can explore this, but Class Dojo actually provides uh, badges and gives positive reinforcement and rewards through budgets or uh, online budgets to budgets to to students so and they have this cute um, little monsters uh, icons or or characters that they can have it so think about like monsters university uh, in for your students so class dojo okay now one thing that you could also do is to build into curriculum in your curriculum whether in whatever modality maybe you can ask the students to do meditation Maybe you can ask the students to do mindfulness exercise. Uh, we've been doing mindfulness exercise in our school for a few years now, and we've really found uh, out the, the benefit. It, actually, it helps our students to be, cal uh, calm, uh, to be calm. It makes our students a little bit relaxed before they start their classes. And we take the time to ask them to reflect. You know, there's, it's not just reflect, uh, relaxing. It's actually asking them to reflect also. And then, you know, in the end, when we ask them to reflect, we allow them to name their feelings. I think that's very, very important. Um, we need to understand, kailangan natin turuan ng mga bata na matutong hanapin o ilabas ang kanilang nararamdaman. You know, we know what would happen if they keep uh, their feelings to themselves. One way or another, they will just explode and we don't know how to help them. You know, uh, before those things come out, before... Um, before those negative, nasty, you know, um, effects come out, I think we need to help our students. So in your curriculum, whether it's online or different modality, find a way. How can you build in meditation? How can you do mindfulness? Uh, if it's a printed modality, maybe you can add their steps to do meditation. Work with the parents. Maybe they can meditate uh, together or observe, you know, quiet time together, even if they are at home. So that's one way of doing that also. Learner support is very, very important. For learner support, for online counseling, and of course, teletherapy, peer interaction, academic support, spiritual formation activities, find a way of how you can do this. It could be online. It could be through the phone. Um, and if face-to-face if -face is allowed, maybe you can schedule uh, something that, uh, that, that, you could, uh, that, that uh, falls under learner support. So how do you do this? Uh, in the different modalities, you need to find a way because this is reaching out. Remember, in the different modalities, interaction is very, very low. But what we want to happen is we want to met, mitigate the effect. So therefore, we want to help them by finding ways, calling, sending letters, um, interacting with them online. Those are just possible ways. At this time, teacher skills needed well, empathy. Teachers need to practice empathy skills to know what the students are feeling right now. How are they doing? Flexibility and adaptability. If there are students who say they're not feeling well, they're not, uh, they're not fine, 
they cannot do their assessments, they cannot pass their requirements. As teachers, you we need to practice flexibility and adaptability because we need to understand this is the new normal, where the normal is not normal. So we cannot, it's hard to really demand a lot of things from our students. We need to make sure that there's a sense of personal care. But however, we need to teach our students to be accountable. Remember what we talk about social emotional learning, self-regulation, self-awareness, um, self-mastery, self-discipline. While we allow for personal care, at some point we need to establish some rules and routines so that there's a sense of accountability for the students. For example, if they cannot submit the requirement, then we need to make sure that uh, they are accountable with it. Even if we give extension, then we make sure that they are accountable for what they are doing. All right. So I was able to give you, uh, was I was able to give you some uh, tips of how you can build a relationship, grit, resilience. Grit and resilience are actually, you know, not just attitudes they, that are internalized. They are very, very important, essential um, skills. How do we continue uh, helping their students to be passionate and persevere? Uh, with their what what they're, they're doing with what they're learning, how do we help them to bounce back? It's very important to build relationship. It's very important that we understand them, to feel what they're feeling. And for teachers and parents, now is the time to build relationships better, to build partnership. So teachers and parents should be able to contact each other uh, in some way or another, so that they can continue helping the the student at home. I think that's very, very important. There are still a lot of different uh, ways to help our students at this time of the pandemic. And there are a lot. There could be parent ways of to support parents. That is something that we can explore in the next webinar workshop through the other speakers, not necessarily me. But yeah, I think it's very important that it's the, at this time of the pandemic, we, we go beyond academics. We go beyond the academics and help our students realize Oh, our, our, uh, ourselves and every member of the school community that we also need to take care of our psycho social or social emotional uh, health right so there thank you so much uh, for for tuning in to my two-part uh, webinar workshop again the first part was talking about Maslow before bloom and the second part was designing for relationship grit and resilience Okay, so thank you so much for watching um, this webinar workshop. Hi, everyone. Thank you again for listening or for viewing, uh, for watching my, my session. Um, uh, I think uh, I really love that you are very engaged. And I saw some of the comments of the, uh, a lot of uh, comments actually are are, are saying that this is a very informative topic. Um, this is just, you know, the, the surface part of this topic. What I want uh, really, the call to action really is, you know, let's start the conversation in our schools. Um, like what I've said a while ago, there are a lot of us who are into, you know, we are uh, upskilling ourselves. We're learning new skills on, on how to create modules, on how to use technology, you know, to create uh, learning materials for, for remote learning or for distance education, as we as we adopt um, as we adopt the different modalities that we have right now, but it's really um, what really my, the challenge right now is to start talking about how the students can cope with with the pandemic. So let's that's the call to action right now for this session. I have a few questions here, but I do hope that you could uh, continue sending in your questions. Um, the Rex team behind uh, behind the scenes are are working hard to look into your questions. The first question is, um, sir, what can you say about uh, online divide? Um, when we speak of the digital divide or the in, uh, online divide, um, it speaks about how the pandemic, I think the digital divide has been really existing even before. Um, if you look at, at UNESCO, for example, or the UN, um, the UNESCO for ICT, for example, um, Access to ICT is um, is a right. Access to the internet is uh, is a right right now. And you know uh, why are they saying that? Because the internet provides a lot of opportunities, um, information, um, commerce, you know, uh, delivery of of 
of a lot of things, even beyond information and even education. So what they wanted to do was to use ICT as a way to bridge, you know, to bring in, uh, to, to reach those who are at the, uh, at the ends of corners of the society. But what happened was that ICT actually contributed more into making the gap bigger. So the digital divide actually speaks of the gap that is present between those who can access the internet well and uh, those who do not have access to the internet. So when you say access to the internet, it, it already assumes like that there are devices, learning devices, mobile devices, computers, laptops, all of those things that will enable you to reach the uh, to to connect to the internet. But the digital divide right now, because of the pandemic, it makes it more apparent. It makes it clearer. It makes it more obvious. The haves and the have-nots, right? So what is uh, happening right now is the challenge. How do we address digital divide? Um, this is very tough because number one. For systems, like for the public schools, we have to make sure that we have the government working with us, right? So uh, we are very much, uh, we are very much aware that the, the Department of Education with the DICT are working on this, um, but we are we are playing catch up. I think that's the reality right now. We are playing catch up because we need to ensure that we reach all. All, all, all learners. But the challenge here right now is we're racing against time. We will be starting. Uh, we will be starting our, you know, distance education with the different modalities now. And one thing that I really, uh, I really want to 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 offer as a suggestion is the, the digital divide is there. But again, it should not stop us from exploring other modalities, other modalities of distance education. Um, I think it's really because we have not been introduced to the idea of distance education well. Uh, we've been talking about online uh, distance learning. We now have a blended modalities. So we call them blended learning modalities. Um, but we also want to explore other modalities. There are other modalities in distance education that could deliver effective learning. Um, that's the print base. We call them printed modular learning. In distance education, it's simply called correspondence. Um, distance education where we use learning packets. That's the official term that is being used. Um, but we are now using printed modular learning or modality. Uh, very important that we use the term modality um, because it speaks about the, the, the way of delivering, uh, delivering learning. Um, so, but we cannot also remove the fact that the digital divide affects right, those students who cannot access. This is the challenge here. For those designing online um, learning modules, whether they're you know digital learning modules online or offline, I hope that they don't get more advantage to those who are using printed. So this is one thing that you, I need you to consider when you design your modules, when you design your learning experiences, and even your assessments. Make sure that you are hitting the basic. Hindi pwedeng mas maganda ang online. Um, mga online classes case sa mga print print based classes at some point there will be advantages but don't focus on those advantages because you want to hit uh, the basic you want to make uh, we, you want to make sure that all students regardless of the modality that they are having right now or they will be having to uh, that they will be undergoing to 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 under, uh, to have learn uh, to make sure that they're learning we don't uh, we don't give advantage, right? So look at your assessments, for example. Um, mas mataas ba ang magiging grade ng nag-online nag kaysa sa nag-print? Especially when, they're, when you're adopting uh, two modality, uh, modalities at the same time. That should not be possible because you're not assessing the student's uh, work by its content, but you're assessing student based on what they have. So, you, you can do, you, so again, Look at your assessments, for example. Are, is it equitable? Is it fair? Is the rubrics or are the rubrics designed for fairness, right? Uh, there's, uh, there are a lot of educators who give premium to design. Mas maganda yung cover niya. Um, it's really, that's really sad because we are grading students based on the design. Look at the content. So um, your rubrics or assessments should be fair. Even through with the learning design, for uh, with the learning experiences. For example, formative assessment. Hindi pwedeng mas maganda, 
mas mataas, uh, mas maganda ang online quizzes at offline quizzes and they are given much feedback as compared to the print base. If you expect to give feedback to those who go online or offline digital learning, it still should be the same with the print base. Even with TV and radio, um, print based TV and radio are limited. These are one-way system. So therefore, you need to look for ways to ensure that 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 you are able to give feedback. And I want to situate this again with interaction, with communication, with relationship. You need to find a way to be able to um, connect with students who are using print these materials, who are using TV and radio as broadcast, uh, uh, TV and radio broadcast as modalities for learning. I, I told you a while ago, you can call. If it's possible to visit, you can also visit. So digital divide is there. But we need to find a way to work around this digital divide. Um, so thank you for that, uh, for that question. I hope that was uh, I was able to answer it. Um, another one from Jong CL. Sir, do you have any practical suggestions on how to do teletherapy to senior high school students or teenagers? Um, practical structure would, num would be number one. Uh, practical suggestion would be number one to create your structure. You need to find a way. For example, are you going to use uh, are we going to use uh, calling uh, or or through telephone? Are you going to uh, are you going to uh, are you going to use video conferences? If you're going to do it, what's your protocol? Uh, when you do teletherapy, also look also at privacy. Who is with the student? Are there people who will be listening? Will you be recording it? Um, what what what? What is the area? What are the areas that you will have to talk with or talk about when you have teletherapy also? I have some friends um, overseas who are leaving some schools and they actually work on teletherapy, but they have to establish some parameters, especially in terms of privacy, student privacy, because, you know, it, they, those could be hacked or, or, or tapped, uh, uh, tapped illegally. Okay, so make sure it's like online guidance counseling. But since it's online, you look at your structure, you look at your parameter also. Okay, so thank you for uh, John CL for that question. I hope that was uh, I was able to answer them. Uh, there's another question by, by, by Mayot Placente, Mayot Placente Valenzuela. She says, um, thank you for this meaningful webinar. It would really be challenging for teachers to incorporate Maslow and Bloom in learning. What are we going to do with a few no, no so responsible, not so responsible um, students. Um, I think it's always good to ask. Um, we label them. We label them already as uh, not so responsible students. It's always good to it's always good to understand the students why are doing this. There's always a reason why kids or why students are are doing or not you know not following instructions, not uh, engaging. There are always problems uh, on, on them. Uh, sometimes it's coming from the domestic setup at home. So you need to understand that, you know, these are kids. They need to be formed. They need to be developed. If we are to give up on them, what's going to happen with education? The education system was not made for the perfect students. The education, actually, there are no perfect students. The education, stu uh, the education system is meant for all students. Well, uh, it, it could start with, number one, not labeling them. So not labeling them, looking into their actions. Uh, mindset, I think it's because of the mindsets that we have also. Um, again, my commentary, is that, my commentary is that, you know, uh, we've always focused on perfect students. We've always celebrated the, celebrated the perfect ones. There are some students who give up studying who do not want to engage anymore with the teachers because in one way or another teachers have become you know uh, teachers are the one who have actually put them down you know uh, there are a lot of practices in the classroom that actually do not promote growth mindset the great resilience are actually under the idea of growth mindset for example committing mistakes when students commit mistake we get mad at them there are teachers who get mad at them when they ask questions, teachers get mad at their uh, at their questions for not understanding what has been taught. I think there should be a shift in mindset. Um, it's it's in the system. It's in the system. Uh, we I think we always aim for perfection. We often forget that mistakes happen. We do not focus on uh, on uh, we tend to uh, we tend to forget that mistakes 
failures make up humanity, right? It what it, it is what makes us human, right? So therefore, change mindset, understand them, put yourself in their position. You know, dig deeper, dig deeper, connect with parents. I think that's very very home, important right now for distance education. Connecting with parents, partnering, making student uh, school. Um, school and home partnership is a key right now because we need to make sure that they are not just stakeholders. Stakeholders sound so business, right? It sounds so business. Why not treat them as partners in education? Teachers, parents, they are partners in education also. So I hope that's, that's one. Uh, those are some uh, tips that I can g- give you, that I gave you, might, I, and I hope that uh, those help. Um, there's another one, sir, in our division, we will be using printed modular modality. What can you say about horizontal alignment? Um, what do you mean by horizontal alignment? Um, horizontal, uh, which means horizontal alignment. Is this about the curriculum or the instruction? If this is about instruction or the curriculum or how you design learning experiences, then it's very important that you align Horizontal alignment means that you look at your most essential learning competencies and then align all your learning experiences. This is actually how uh, how lessons should be developed. It's called the backward design. When you align everything, your assessments should be aligned on what they are supposed to measure. Your learning experiences should be aligned on what they are supposed to teach. Ang nangyayari kasi is baliktad. We plan, plan, plan everything. We don't, uh, and then we look at assessment in the end. Ang nangyayari, sometimes the lesson does not hit the assessment uh, anymore because there is no alignment, there's no checking. So it's important that, that you need to do horizontal alignment in terms of, of, of uh, designing learning experiences. How important is this in this VUCA world or VUCA world? Um, you know, horizontal alignment, this is very... Um, I want to connect the VUCA or VUCA world with the idea of grit and resilience. Kaya nga importante ang grit and resilience because in this world, it's very volatile, it's uncertain, it's ambiguous, there are, there's a lot of change. If these things are happening, you know the kids that we are so protecting right now, there are a lot of parents who would protect their kids for every mistake that they make. It's the parents who's gonna admit, sorry ma'am, sorry teacher, mistake ko po, hindi po mistake ng anak ko. There even there are a lot of parents right now who would say, you know, um, they 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 don't want their kids to commit a mistake. They are so afraid. We have helicopter parents. Yung parents sa sobrang nakiki alam na even sa academics wala nang mali ang anak niya. Gusto niya laging perfect. You know, for those kinds of parenting styles, you need to let your kids fail. You need to let your kids experience failure because if not, they would not know how to survive this world. There are a lot of students right now. You know, there's a phenomenon in college right now. Even in college, parents are calling. Parents are calling their professors and uh, college instructors telling that it's not the mistake of their son who's already very, very old. So I don't know. Maybe let your kids take responsibility. Uh, This is what we mean by grit and resilience. We need to let them understand that there are challenges in the world. And this could often lead to some failure. But failure is not the end of everything. Failure is very, very important. To fail, fail, F-A-I-L, it's your first attempt in learning. If it leads to failure or mistake, it's okay. That's how you, co- uh, that's how you learn. Nobody's perfect. Again, the system that we're living, the society that we're living, puts too much premium on being perfect. If you're a teacher and you cannot be a perfect teacher, then don't demand so much perfection from your student. If you're a principal and school leader, you cannot be perfect by yourself, then don't demand so much. What do we mean by that? We prepare for everything. We cover for everything. uh, But when we commit a mistake, we say it's okay. But then we learn from it. Of course, kung paulit-ulit na yung mistake mo, ibig sabihin you're not learning from it anymore. Okay, there are so many different kinds of mistakes that we could commit. But there are some things that we could prepare for. There are some things that even if we prepare, things just happen. Grit resilience comes in. Okay. Um, there's a, Maybe this is the second to the last question. Um, Ligaya Sanchez Nunez. I'm a teacher in the public school in the province of Cebu. The only applicable modality is through the use of modules. 
let's clarify, printed modules. Because there could be online modules. You know, in distance education, by the way, everything is modular. Okay? So when you say our modality is the use of modules, how? Printed, online, offline, things like that. You need to be clear because there's also online modules. So I think this is, maybe this is a printed module. The big problem there is how can they learn if their parents cannot be their, their uh, teacher because they are illiterate. Again, I've already answered this before. If, if you want to partner your, with parents, orient their parents, why not teach their parents first? If they don't know how to read, then involve them also. If you want to partner with them, then at least orient them. Orient them with the technology that you will be using. If they cannot read, why not introduce them, right? Better late than, than never. I have some friends. Can I just say again, and he'll be my guest tomorrow. I'm plugging in. He'll be my guest tomorrow in my Empower Ed Live session. It's my good friend, Ryan uh, Habitan Oman. He has Nanai teachers. He trains Nanais who did not know how to read before to become teachers of their kids in terms of literacy. So it's just a matter of going out there. This is, I think th this is a very simple answer Then make the parents literate. How do you do that? Why not go to their homes, visit them, give them printed modules also, right? So I don't, that, that could be very, very challenging, but there's a way to do it. And I'm sure if you want to know more how to do this, then tune in tomorrow in my Empower Ed channel. There's a live session with, with speakers who, are, who belong to uh, the most challenging situations in the Philippines. We also have a guest on uh, indigenous material, uh, indigenous people communities, indigenous communities. So make sure that you tune in um, to my uh, channel tomorrow. And then last, Grace Nevado, how to create assessment that will both benefit students who will be using different modalities. In, in order to do that, create a basic level, a basic form of the assessment. Even if you create a basic form of the assessment, make sure that the assessment will retain its validity, whether it's delivered uh, online, offline, or in printed ones. If it's a project, then make sure that the project is clear enough so that it retains validity or performance stats project or product, it retains its validity whether in different modality. In deep wedding, sobrang okay, sobrang ganda kasi it's online, tapos yung sa, sobra, uh, sa printed, wala na, bahala na sila. No, you cannot do that. Again, always start with the basic requirements. You cannot go in the, the modality online na. Start with basic design. Start with the basic design. Uh, start with assessment and then your learning experiences. What, the, what are the basic components? And then from there, dun na kayo magkakaroon ng contextualization according to the different modalities. All right. So there are a lot of questions right now. And what I, uh, I just want to end it. Uh, again, my call to action is please look, join seminar workshops or webinar workshops that talks about social emotional learning. How do we build grit, resilience? Kasi kahit sobrang ganda, even if your, your, your learning experiences, your assessments, your unit plans or module plans are so good, they're so well designed, if the kids are not ready to learn, then those will be put into ways. You need to make sure that the learners are ready, that they are safe, and they are disposed to learn. So therefore, make sure that there's a talk about Maslow before Bloom and Maslow and Bloom. All right. So I end this. Uh, I end this session right now. Webinar workshop. Thank you so much for for watching the different webinar workshop of the um, 